Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you here this evening. and I'm delighted uh, to be able to stand at the beginning of this uh, dinner on global economy and financial services uh, and also to reflect on the strapline, managing through the current uh, turmoil. Uh, that's not for once, I'm glad to say, about domestic politics. And Greece is giving us an example of uh, clear direction in that regard. Uh, but turmoil, indeed, that, of course, you know as well as I do, is impacting very dramatically on the global economy as Joan set out. Before I say a few words, let me please also thank our collaborators this evening, Joan Hoey herself, but also Nictarea Pasarevaki and all of the Economist team, Anna Kalyani and Kenny Evangelou from the British Hellenic Chamber, the team here at the Grand Hyatt, Governor Yanis Donaras, Lord Jim O'Neill, and Eleni Vretou, and Chris Barton, uh, His Majesty's Trade Commissioner for Europe, uh, all of whom you'll be hearing from a little bit later on. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need an ambassador or diplomat uh, to stand in front of you to point out the obvious impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine for the British and Greek people, but also much more widely. We've seen a huge increase in energy and food prices, placing serious burdens on families, leading to unprecedented government support schemes. And of course, this supply side shock caused by the most serious war on the European continent since 1945 comes on top of the supply disruptions and economic activity that were the aftermath of the most serious pandemic in a generation, if not in a century. One does not have to be an economist or a financial expert to see the impact of those shocks. In the United Kingdom, the government is determined to bring down inflation from levels that are much too high. And I take some confidence and encouragement from Joan's remarks uh, about that perhaps happening earlier, uh, later on this summer. We know that higher interest rates make things hard for many people. But striking the right balance between inflation, monetary policy and financial stability is an inherently difficult job, a topic that I'm sure our distinguished speakers will expand upon. And of course, sanctions, something again that we heard about from Joan, has almost become a permanent feature as a tool of foreign policy, playing an increasingly prominent role since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But as we also know, and I've talked about to many of you in the shipping and financial community, the economic effects and political effects of those sanctions can be slower than policymakers may choose whilst the disruption to global supply chains is often much more rapid and potentially more enduring. All of this, whilst the global economic and trade order is showing signs of increasing fragmentation. More countries are tending towards protectionism and the primacy of the Bretton Woods institutions is being eroded. I was in London last week for our annual gathering of ambassadors and we were privileged to hear from Mia Motley the Prime Minister of Barbados, enthusiastically pushing the Bridgetown agenda and arguing for urgent reform of the international financial institutions. So this is a global conversation and these are global impacts, even if for many the war in Ukraine may feel a continent away. In the decades ahead, it is likely that the world will have moved further towards multipolarity with the geographical and economic center of gravity moving eastwards towards the Indo-Pacific. One reason why my government is talking of its Indo-Pacific tilt since we have left the European Union. An increasing great power competition may be unlikely to mean a return to Cold War style blocks, but instead the influence of middle ground powers is likely to grow further, particularly when they act together. So, we clearly must make progress internationally in this increasingly volatile world. We need to cooperate with allies, new and old, against those that are driving instability. And to this point, whilst the United Kingdom may no longer be a member of the European Union, 
that does not, of course, mean that we have somehow turned our back on Europe. Through geography and much more besides, we remain European, and our ambition is to build modern, strong relationships with our European partners and allies based on our common values, reciprocity, and cooperation across shared interests, just as we have done in response to Ukraine. And finally, a word about the United Kingdom and Greece specifically. In October 2021, shortly after I arrived, we signed a strategic bilateral framework agreement, a clear example of our mutual determination to invest in the sort of patient, long-term diplomacy that we believe is necessary. This strategic bilateral framework enables closer cooperation across a wide range of sectors, not just foreign policy and defense and trade and investment, but health, education, culture, tourism, and maritime affairs. And a little bit of publicity. I was delighted to hear from uh, Minister Kikilias, the tourism minister, that in 2022, the inbound number of British tourists exceeded those coming from Germany for the first time in a decade or so. So British tourists are playing their part in the resurgence of the Greek tourist economy. But these interests bind our two nations together, along with our commitment to democracy and freedom, our shared responsibility as allies and partners in NATO, and as maritime nations with a global outlook and a belief in free trade and strong, open, global economy. These shared values and interests are the ones that we must preserve and advance, even if, especially if, today, the world is in turmoil. So thank you very much for joining us. I am sure you will have uh, an inspiring and enlightening evening, and I'm very pleased that we have been able to work with Nectaria and the Economist team uh, to make this evening happen. Thank you very much.